Good morning. It is really good to see all of you here this morning. I was marveling at the words that we sang a moment ago. I will not boast in anything, no gift, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. That is precisely what we're here to do this morning. To remember that resurrection and the difference that it makes for our lives. Really glad that you're here today. Okay, so we've all seen them before. Time and time again, we've seen them. The I just can't believe that's true before and after pictures. How many times have you seen that number in your life? Hard to believe before and after pictures. So the couch potato next door becomes Arnold Schwarzenegger. And just 15 minutes a day on whatever, the Bowflex, the Gazelle, something you saw on Shark Tank. And that bright white soccer jersey that was covered in grass stains and SpaghettiOs, story of my childhood, you put it into the wash and every time you pull it out and and wouldn't you know it, it looks as good as new. And don't you just remember what it looked like before? How many times have we seen this? How many different ways have we seen before and after? Uh, Entire industries of television are built on the before and after, this just look at it now moment. So we have these shows about houses that go from shabby to chic and trash that turns into treasure, Uh, people who learn how to sing and dance and cook and knit, you name it, tragedies that turn into triumphs. Uh, Our favorite children's movies and, and fairy tales, they follow this same story. Uh, Cinderella and her little mouse friends, what do they do? Take a pumpkin, turn it into a carriage. They take a forgotten stepsister, they they turn it into a princess. The beast in Beauty and the Beast, he learns how to use a fork. He learns manners, puts some of us husbands to shame. Sleeping Beauty, the list could go on and on. These stories and shows that we know and love, they're built around this powerful change. This turnaround, this hard to believe, sometimes too good to be true snapshot we've all seen before and after. We've seen it so much, in fact, that we may be wary a little bit, guarded just a little bit, and maybe rightly so, because we all know about the gimmicks. We know when it looks like a hoax. We know that too good to be true almost always is what? Too good to be true, and we're not falling for it. We know that a fairy tale is exactly that. Grab some popcorn and enjoy it, but don't hold your breath. Life doesn't work like that. And yet, we also know that the best and greatest things in this world... The truest and realest hopes that we have in this life, the ones that make life worth living, the ones that make hope worth hoping, those very real things, they too look like this. They too tell the story of what used to be, what was before, and what happened next. Ephesians chapter 2 is one of those stories. If you have a Bible, go ahead and be turning there. This is the second passage in this series that we started last week, a a series that I'm calling One, the letter to the Ephesians. And this passage tells us, this chapter does, about our one hope, the one hope that all humanity shares in common. And this one hope that we're given in Ephesians chapter 2 It is given to us in these two powerful snapshots, a before and after story. And I'm telling you, in many ways, it may be kind of hard to believe. Let's listen to what it has to say. Ephesians 2 and verse 1, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us once lived like them, among them, 
in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, Christ's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So you can see the the before and after, can't you? And it could not be more dramatic of a difference, right? So Paul is writing here, you remember, to the church that is in Ephesus. So he's writing to a group of people that ought to be living in the after part of that equation. Uh, But just like any gathering of the church, uh, there may be some present to hear the word of Paul read in the church of Ephesus, both then and maybe here today. We're living in the before. The difference between the two could not be more sharply drawn, could it? So verse 1 begins to give us snapshot number 1. And a few things stand out immediately about it that get my attention. How about you were dead? Does that get your attention? It certainly gets mine. It's not something you get to say very often. You were dead in the past tense. As if it used to apply, but doesn't apply anymore. Yet this is what you were, Paul says to the church. Dead. Living. But dead. Spiritually speaking, pulseless. Flatlined. Why? Because of your transgressions and sins, says verse 1. Because of those things that people do that are disobedient and rebellious toward God. Transgressions and sins. Because you were following the course of this world, which is uh, Paul's way of saying you were living in the lifestyles you see in this world that are not God's way. Following the course of this present life rather than the course of God. You were dead because you were captive to your desires and passions and captive to the powers of evil in this world. You may remember that peculiar phrase in there, the ruler of the power of the air. Uh, It's basically talking about Satan and the forces of evil that are now at work, says verse 2 and verse 3. This is the picture we're given. And all of us, we're told, all people... Once lived like this, living, but spiritually not living. We were by nature, by our sinful nature, that is, children of wrath, like everyone else. This is not a pretty picture. The before picture that we're given in this passage is you and me living, but not really living, dead and captive and held down by nothing less than the spiritual forces of evil and the power of sin over our lives. But then the picture changes because God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he has loved us, made us alive again. He made our before into this God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, this God made us alive again, alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God set us free 
from captivity and sin and our passions and the powers of evil. He raised us up, verse 6 says. He seated us with Christ. The picture has totally changed. And it's kind of hard to believe. Am I crazy to admit that? For some of us in our heart of hearts, we may find it hard to believe in these pictures that are laid out before us. Perhaps even right now, as you hear it, somewhere in your mind, you might be kind of wrestling with this just a little bit. Because, I mean, just like all those outlandish before and afters we've seen before, maybe we're wondering, should I be skeptical of this? Could I really believe that this is true? So the struggle may come from a number of places. On the one hand, there may be that place in our hearts which looks at that first picture we just saw and says, come on now, dead? Isn't that a little bit harsh? Dead? Is it really that bad? Wouldn't it be better to say before Christ we were good, but now, hey, look, we're better. Wouldn't that be a better picture? Isn't that more what it's like? Perhaps somewhere deep in our minds, there's a part of our hearts, there's a part of our minds that maybe wants to push back a little bit against that first picture. And yet, if all that Christ is for the world is that, someone who makes good people a little bit better, then why did he come as he comes and live as he lives and die as he dies? Why did he suffer as he suffers and surrender all that he is so that we might be a little bit better? Does it not cheapen the cross of Christ? When we say to ourselves, dead in sin, was it really that bad? Because if all that Christ is, is someone who makes the good a little bit better. That is not the Savior that we proclaim and worship today. And I'm not saying that human beings are incapable of good or that they're not created good, because we are. What I'm saying is that to reject that before picture worries me. Because it begins to say that we don't really need a Savior all that much. And maybe it also begins to say that we don't really grasp the seriousness of evil, of our own sin, the problem of sin, quite enough. So Paul will say elsewhere that the wages of sin is death. But Christ did so much more than make us just a little bit better. The gift of God, same type of thing that he says in Ephesians, the gift of God is not just being a little bit better, it's eternal life. It's a whole life change, as hard as that may be to believe. On the one hand, it may be hard to believe that we really were so desperate, that we really did need a Savior so much, and yet, that's the picture we're given. On the other hand, we may struggle with the next picture that we see, the the picture of lavish grace that we find in Christ. Maybe somewhere in the places of our hearts, we look at that second picture and we say, come on now, free? Was anything ever good and really free? Wouldn't it be better to say, well, the grace God offers is free, but only if you're one of those people that really deserves it. It's really worth it. It's really earned it. And maybe there's a part of us that says, yeah, I can believe that God is rich in mercy and that he sent Jesus because he loves people, but probably not people like me. People who've done what I've done or who have gone down the path that I've gone down, who have made the choices I've made. I mean, who really loves like that? Hard to believe. So there might be some who hear the story and they look at the picture that's before them and they think to themselves, it's just too good to be true. 
And yet what Ephesians is saying to us is that God has already shown us that too good to be true does not apply to his power. And it does not apply to his work. And it certainly does not apply to his grace. In fact, if you were just to go a few verses before that passage we've been in this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, if you just go a few verses before that before and after picture, that death to life story in Ephesians chapter 2, at the very end of chapter 1, Paul gives us the very same snapshots, the very same before and after, talking about Jesus himself. Here's what he says in that passage, verse 17, Paul prays, that the church might know the hope to which you have been called, the hope to which God has called you, and that hope is bound up in the fact that God put His power to work in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. It's the same picture. Raised Him up, made Him alive again, seated Him with God in the heavenly places. These are the very same things that Paul has said about us in verses 5 and 6 of Ephesians chapter 2. Raised us up with Christ. uh, Made us alive again with Christ. Seated us with Him in the heavenly places. It's the very same picture. That too good to be true promise, God has already shown us that it is true. He's proved it's true because He's done it already in Jesus. We have no reason to doubt or question that God is powerful enough or gracious enough to raise the dead and to overcome sin because He's shown it to us. When the tomb was found empty and Jesus lived again, that is the hope to which He has called you. It's the one hope. The hope of Christ is our hope, one hope for all people. And as hard as it may be to come to terms with that, we do have reason to believe it because God has shown it to us already. He's shown us his power at work. He's shown us that too good to be true does not apply to His grace. And guess what? He keeps showing us still. Again and again and again. He keeps showing us in His church, in this world. He keeps proving that His hard-to-believe power really is true. He keeps raising the dead. He keeps making us alive again in Jesus. I'll give you an example. So earlier this week, I actually bumped into someone and had the chance to talk to someone who uh, had been on some trips to Huron, South Dakota with me when I was a teenager in the youth group here. So College Hill, one of our youth group destinations, uh, many people's vacation destination as well, Huron, South Dakota. It's a long way up there, uh, but we would go up there year after year and do a vacation Bible school there, and we would work with the little congregation there and their big, broad-shouldered, smiling preacher, a man named Timmy Walker. Some of you may remember him, maybe know him. I think I've even talked about him in a sermon before. But as I was talking with this person who had gone on these trips with me to to Huron, I was thinking about Timmy Walker, and I remembered the way that Timmy would talk about Ephesians chapter 2 as if it were written about him, like we all should, I guess. And he would stand there on one leg, And he would tell the story of how a motorcycle accident took his other leg and the weeks he spent in the hospital thereafter and the people who came to see him there from the church, people he did not know, people who knew his wife, Samantha. 
And as he was there in the hospital experiencing this tragedy and also experiencing this love from virtually strangers in the name of Jesus, he began to think long and hard about his life and where it was going. And after facing death, he faced it again in his heart. He chose the life that Christ gives the free gift of God by His grace through faith that saves us. He was baptized. He was raised with Christ. And here we are telling the story because He devoted His whole life thereafter to telling the hard-to-believe riches of God's grace. Hard to believe, but true. His life became a before and after, proof of God's power, His work, and most of all, His grace. And millions like Him are in the world today. Each story is unique. Some are dramatic. Some are subtle and slow. But they are all proof that the God who raised Jesus from the dead, that same God, is still powerful. He's still working. And His grace is still so good and yet so true. We are not just a little bit better in Christ. It's a brand new life. Alive with Christ. If you're listening today and you want to have new life, if you want to have your picture retaken, if you are tired of the before of life in sin and death, if you're ready for that sweet thereafter of grace and life with Christ, maybe it's time for you to take that step of faith that you need to take, for it's by grace that you are saved through faith. It's that faith that we profess when we say that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God And we acknowledge in our hearts and in our lives that in sin and death we are without Him. But God is great and His grace reaches us. And in the waters of baptism we surrender our lives. We're raised up again. Raised with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Maybe it's time for someone to take that step today. I would encourage you to do it because... His grace is so good and so true. Maybe you're listening today and and you're living in that after, so to speak. You have been raised with Christ. You're living life as a faithful follower of Jesus. My challenge for you today would be the way that the passage ends by reminding us there's one more picture to be taken. Picture of you working in Christ. Not because you need to earn His grace, but because it's been freely given. You've been changed. And so you are His workmanship. You are what He's made you in Jesus. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life so that we might walk in them. If you've been changed by the work of God and His grace... Be the proof of that grace at work. Be the before and after that the world might see and though it's hard to believe, begin to see that God's grace is that good. Maybe there's someone who needs to respond publicly today. This would be the time to do that as we sing this next song. I hope that we will all respond in our hearts to the beauty of God's grace and the one hope we have while we stand and while we sing.